Um, I'm going to be talking today on war, on the subject of war. And I was really interested in the words that came today about warfare, spiritual warfare. This is physical warfare I'm going to be speaking a little bit about today because of the issues. Um, so I want you to check out everything I say. I always say that, don't I? And I know uh, I, I spoke about Revelation 20 last time I spoke, and I have been challenged about that and my inter interpretation of it. And we're going to be dealing with that, but not today, but we will be having meetings. So it's up to you and your responsibility to challenge me on what I teach. And that's really healthy to do that. And our new elders, uh, you need to be doing that to be on top of the scriptures that I give. So get your Bibles out now, elders. <laughs> yeah. But it was lovely to see, you know, the, the, the elders appointing themselves, really. And... Uh, and, and taking charge of those things because that's what they're supposed to do. We all play this just this small role to make up one big jigsaw of a body mm. which is equal in status mm. no matter what your ministry is. In fact, I think more than anything, the ministry of service at the door and in the kitchen is greater than the ministry of teaching, although teachers are going to be judged more harshly, which is why you need to check out everything I say. And make sure that I'm right, because uh, I'm going to blame you if I get it wrong. <laughs> if you haven't challenged me. That's fair, isn't it? <laughs> the murder of these three young boys, and I'm going to name them, because we, we kind of forget the names, don't we, of people who have, who have died because of their faith. Naftali Frankel and A.L. Ephraim and Gilad Shea died because they were Jews. Because they were living on land that God gave to them. That's why they died. They did nothing wrong. They were like your children and my children. They were going about their daily lives. When suddenly they were taken from them by the enemies of God. And then a young Arab boy, 17 year old Mohammed, Mohammed Abu Kader, died. We don't know how he died. We don't know what. Who, the, who the, the perpetrator was, we don't know anything about him. But he was a young man, a 17-year-old, died because he was born in a land in which his leaders, the Palestinian Arab leaders, won't allow the Jewish people to live in. He died somehow because of that. And we in the nations had the arrogance to actually say and make statements about his death, which has caused rioting in Jerusalem, particularly yesterday. And uh, John Kerry said this, he said, he denounced what he said was Jewish revenge, before we even know whether the perpetrator was Jewish or whether he was an Arab. We don't know who killed this boy. It was just so sad he died, and then so sad that world leaders accused the Jewish people of killing him. That isn't known yet, and we've got to pray really that, that actually the truth will come out, because I don't, I've never heard a Jewish person, in all the time that I've been to, in Israel, speak in terms of hatred towards the Palestinian Arab people, particularly young Palestinian Arabs. I've never heard that, so I was quite surprised when Jews were accused of that. And then there were, there's been 125 rockets hit the south because of this incident. And Nomi, you know Nomi with the family, some of you may not know Nomi, she's a, a Jewish lady who lives in the south in Kafir a kibbutz in the south of Israel, who was here only just six weeks ago with her daughter Daron, who had had a serious operation because of the trauma that she did experience down there. And she said, now these uh, young Jewish boys have been uh, kidnapped. Things are really bad in the south and Hamas are firing rockets, etc. And she was taking Duran up to her sisters in the north in Kiryat Smona because Duran, little 14-year-old girl, couldn't cope with the rockets. And uh, Anyway, they're back home now, but there's more rockets this week. There were 45 rockets hit that community. Houses damaged, cars damaged, a plastics factory was set on fire. And uh, I wrote to a, a lady who, who um, represents the Church of Scotland, although she's an individual, she represents the Church of Scotland and EAPPI, the Christian group who are 
really anti-Israel, and she said that, you know, these Qassam rockets really aren't anything at all. They, they won't pierce a wall. So I wrote to her and explained to her that these Qassam rockets, the shrapnel in 2005, pierced the head of a little girl who was covering her brother on the street when a Qassam landed. And it went through her head and damaged her brain and killed her. People are making assumptions about these things that are causing so much trauma in the Jewish community that it's, well, it's despicable, really. We can't make judgments in that way about what's happening there. And we've got to pray for both um, the Arabs and the Jews, the young people who are not part of this conflict. The Arab leadership in that area are the people who are making the demands on the people to fire the rockets. And it's to do with terrorism. It has nothing to do with ordinary people like you and I. No. It has to do with terrorism and an Arab incentive, or a, 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 sorry, an Arab goal to destroy the whole of Israel. And I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to talk about today, is, is that in particular. But before I go on, I just want to um, just tell you about the, the email that I had from Nomi on Friday. It's, very, it's a very difficult few weeks since the kidnapping. She talks, she, does, she doesn't write good English. She said, last week was terrible. I stayed home and I didn't work because Duran was too afraid to stay alone. Now the government gave an ultimatum to Hamas 40, 48 hours ago to stop the firing. Kafaraza is full with soldiers um, there, uh, and all the area is full with IDF forces. Hamas keep firing, but I don't think our government will do anything unless they hit Tel Aviv. And then she says, Shabbat Shalom to everybody at Father's house. So she's, and the people down in the south feel really lonely and isolated, and they don't feel that the government is supporting them. So please, please pray for Israel and for um, Hamas and the uh, terrorists to stop firing mm -hmm. towards Israel. But Yeshua gave a prophecy, and we see that in Luke 21, 9 to 10. If you get your Bibles out, it says, when you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. He then said, nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Now he's speaking about the times that we're living in. And he's speaking about the whole of the last 2,000 years really. But, but it's to do with the time that we live in. And he's not talking about the tribulation here. The, the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, which you'll see in Jeremiah 30. And I'll read that to you now. Because that is a future time. He's talking about our times. But let me just mention this about the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30, verses 1 to 7, it says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you, for the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will bring them back to the land I gave to their ancestors, and they shall take possession of it. These are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah, Thus says the Lord, we have heard a cry of panic, of terror, and no peace. Ask now and see, can a man bear a child? Why then do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor? Has every face turned pale? Alas, that day is so great there is no lighted. It's a time of distress for Jacob, yet he shall be rescued from it. And then Yeshua says in Matthew 24, 29 to 30, he says, immediately after the tribulation, in those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be taken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So we see this time of Jacob's trouble is for the Jewish people in the future. And the one who brings an end to that is Yeshua. He comes and brings an end to it. But Yeshua in, in, in the scripture in Luke 9, 21 is clearly talking about kingdoms and nations fighting between each other. Which is what I want to talk about. 
But first I want to talk, just mention what is war. Because we know what war is spiritually, don't we? Because you're all in, and we are all in a spiritual battle, aren't we? How many of you feel that? Mm -hmm. Or have felt it? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Are we all on the same page? Yes. Is there a battle in the spiritual realm? Yes. yes. Is there? Absolutely. Yeah. It definitely is, isn't there? You can feel it. I mean, I, I'm sure, you know, you elders feel it as well. You will, if you haven't already. <laughs> but, you will. but the battle is in the spirit realm there. But there are wars which take place on earth regarding the spiritual realm. Regarding who God is and who Satan is. And the two clash, don't they? They have in history always clashed. God called the Israelites as soon as he calls them. He, he takes them into Egypt and then from Egypt into the land of Canaan. And wars take place, don't they? Battles, the whole, you know, the book of Samuel, Kings, and, and these books, these, these prophetic books and books about the history of Israel all talk about wars, don't they? Mm. I don't know anyone, if anyone's read anything by Karl von Clausewitz, who, is, um, who was a Prussian soldier during the French Revolution between 1792 and 1815. Have you not read that, Judith? <laughs> and yet she was a counsellor for years. You'd think she'd read that, wouldn't you? But Karl von Clausewitz is actually considered by all war historians and Holocaust historians as the expert on war. Have you not read it, Marie? It's a bedtime. It's a bedtime. <laughs> She'll treat that, yeah. But she reads it on war by John Grisham. <laughs> But uh, Clausewitz, when he wrote these, 1792 to 1815, was a, a soldier in the Prussian army when he saw the French revolutionary forces come across the whole of Europe. And he wrote this book based on what he saw and based on what he understood. And as I say, people refer to it today. It's a really interesting book. <laughs> I find it interesting anyway. Yeah, sorry? You can get a copy of it on the internet. I got it like a couple of quid from Amazon because not many people want it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but actually, it's a really good book. He says this. He, or he makes a number of points about war. He says, war is an act of violence intended to compel our opponent to do our will. Does that make sense? Mm. War is an act of violence intended to compel our opponent to do our will. Christendom for 2,000 years has done that hmm. because we slaughtered people if we didn't follow the doctrine of the Catholic Church and then the Protestant Church that followed. Let's just not single out the Catholic Church. And we've enforced our will throughout history. But so has Islam. Islam has done exactly the same, enforced its will on people. And it is doing so today and that's increasing. Number two, he says, this is another part of the book, he says, war is an act of violence pushed to its utmost bounds. That makes sense as well, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. If we are to defeat an enemy, number three, we must proportion our efforts to, the, to his powers of resistance. So if we're going to um, take on an en enemy, defeat an enemy, we've got to have greater powers. That's what he's saying. We've got to look at the enemy and see, have we got greater powers? Have we got greater strength? Have we got more military power? Have we got more manpower? Have we got more financial power to take on a war? Well, we know in Israel's case that that has never been... Uh, a, a possibility for Israeli forces to have more military might or manpower might or financial might than any of the nations. If we remember 1948, 600,000 Jews, mainly from the Holocaust, fought to defend Israel in 1948 against forces from a population community of 45 million. How did they do that? The Six Day War. They were outnumbered three to one in, in military and uh, numbers and uh, uh, hardware. They still won. So this principle only applies to the nations. It doesn't apply to Israel. 1973 Yom Kippur War was exactly the same. Israel is unique from these definitions, really, that um, uh, Klaus Witch talks about. War is never an isolated act. 
It doesn't just affect one country, does it? You know, Hitler went into Poland, we get involved. Second World War, didn't we? Um, Iraq, America going to Iraq, we get involved. It, it, it's not a, a, a war of ice. A country doesn't fight in isolation from other countries. Everybody gets involved in a major war. And we see that now when America speak about what's happening again in Iraq, what's happening in Syria. We want to get involved, don't we? So it's not an isolated act. War does not consist of a single instantaneous blow. It doesn't, it doesn't happen in one day or in one week. War lasts for a long time. It's not one blow. You know, we can say, well, what about a nuclear bomb? You know, Hiroshima was one of those. That was as a result of the Japanese attacking Pearl Harbor. But that was during the Second World War. It was a whole five-year period. It was, uh, it was a culmination of things, wasn't it, between America and Japan. It just doesn't, it isn't one blow. It's a continuous action for a long period of time, very often. The result of war, he says, is not always to be regarded as an absolute. The conquered state often sees in it only a passing evil, which may be repaired after time by means of political combinations. What he's trying to say when you read that chapter of his book is that actually you can overcome a country or a people or a kingdom or a religion and you can actually subdue them for a period of time but they'll always be looking for a way to come back to you either in a political way or in a military way. It's just, it, it's, um, it's not an absolute end. And, and that's true with with the Germany, isn't it? When we conquered Germany, we divided Germany, and then Germany politically, after a long time, grew again through negotiation into a country of its own again. And now Germany, you have to say, leads the EU. You know, Angela Merkel actually is the leader in the EU. So, and I'm not saying anything against that or for it. I'm just saying that only just 60 or 70 years ago, Germany was destroyed, but by political means, she's now overcome her, uh, the people who conquered her. And, and that's the same with Islam. We conquered Islam, they conquered us. We've conquered them, they've conquered us. And now they're rising again. And in, in Spain is a good example, really, where we see that that the Ottoman Empire, the, the Muslims, conquered Spain and then the Christendom conquered Spain and now today Islam, through a process called Dimi, are trying to now take over Spain and other parts of Europe. So there's an ongoing thing, it's not an absolute, it's not an end when someone wins a, a war in natural terms. Ecclesiastes 9, 18 says, Wisdom is better than weapons of war. But one bungler destroys so much good. Yeah. And that is like the John Kerry situation this week yeah. when he called, you know, the, the, the death of this young Arab boy, his sad, tragic death. He said it was due to Jewish revenge. You know, he bungled. It wasn't a wise thing to say because what it caused was all the rioting that we saw on the streets of Jerusalem yesterday. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it causes problems. The mouth, the tongue can cause real problems, can't it? Mm -hmm. And in a war situation, that's increased. In the household, you know, between man and wife, that's devastating. Mm -hmm. The tongue can be devastating, mm -hmm. can't it? Mm -hmm. I've learned to keep my mouth shut now, I don't say anything. <laughs> I just make tea and wash up. John will tell you, I just make tea, <laughs> wash up, clean, tidy, hang out the washing. But, you know, you learn, don't you, guys? You learn, don't you? Is that right, Rob? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right, okay. But Christendom has been, and I'm not talking about born again Christians, I'm talking about Christendom. I'm talking about the whole Christian umbrella has been an organization formed right in the early centuries um, through a, a, a pagan influence, really into a very strong, powerful, militant force, which ended in the Crusades and then continued later on 
in many battles in Europe for many things, and certainly in Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, a battle over the Sabbath and Passover, where thousands of Christians were killed, murdered, because they kept Sabbath and Passover. It was the militant side of Christendom that did that. And then Christendom fueled the Holocaust. And I won't repeat what I normally repeat about that. But Christendom fueled the Holocaust. And today we are becoming militant again in Christendom. You may not see it. If, but, but I'm looking for it and I can see a militancy coming again in Christendom. I don't know whether you're aware, but some believers in, in Texas are arming themselves so that they can take on Obama. If something happens in America, that doesn't suit them. And these are people who say they are Christians. And they are looking towards the weapons of war to take control of certain areas of the United States. That's actually quite frightening, isn't it? But within the so-called, uh, if you like, the growing um, ca um, charismatic movement in the church, we have this thing called, called uh, uh, Dominion Theology or Kingdom Now Theology, and I'll just explain that. Uh, you've heard of it. Some of you will have heard of that, won't you? Uh, but the, it, it's called a kingdom now theology or a dominion theology, which is a false teaching stating that man is used to bring the entire world under the dominion of Christianity by force, if necessary, and then to hand over the Christianized world to Yeshua when he comes. That's the basic theology. That's kind of the definition that I would kind of look at. Look at to look at this dominion theology. And its basic beliefs are God gave Adam dominion over the earth. Satan usurped man's dominion over the earth through the fall of Adam and Eve. Yeshua defeated Satan and took the dominion back in his victory on the cross. Then he gave the dominion to the believers, to the apostles. The church now must gain control of the earth's governmental and social institutions and establish the kingdom of God on earth. Then on the end, then can Yeshua come back. But that theology is sweeping the charismatic movement. And it's, it, it's heavily um, used in the UK and in America in the charismatic prophetic movement uh, where, we, where, where we're taught to take cities have you come across that? Yes. Some of you will have come across it. Yes. We're taught to take this city for God. We're taught to control this government. We're taught, taught to control that piece of land. You're familiar with it. Yeah. yeah. It, it's a really dangerous, uh, a, a militant view of the call that God gave us. This is what Matthew 26, 20, 52 says. Yeshua said to, as Pilate, he said, sorry, to Peter, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Yeshua was peaceful, and he's in the garden. When the Roman soldiers come to, to arrest him, and Peter takes off the ear of the Roman soldier. And Yeshua makes this statement. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. If Christianity take up a sword, we will perish. That's what happened between the wars with Islam and Christianity in history. When he, spoke, when he spoke to Pilate, Pilate said, I'm not a Jew. Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Yeshua answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. He's saying that his kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. So when we fight spiritual battles, we're fighting for a spiritual kingdom, not for an earthly kingdom. Oh, is that, are we all happy with that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mark 16, 15, 16 says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole of creation. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. So Yeshua is saying, go into all the world and proclaim the good news of all creation. But he says there are people who will disagree with this. And what are we to do about that? Can't do anything. We don't beat them up. We don't kill them. We don't lock them away. 
It's God's business to deal with those people who are opposing it. Not ours. Our call is to go and preach the good news. Matthew 10, 11, 14 says, Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. God is saying, go out and give the good news. Tell people about me. Heal the sick, deliver the demons, raise the dead, do these things and preach the gospel, the good news. But if people reject it, don't kill them. He didn't say it in those terms. But it's exactly the same. Walk away and go somewhere else and preach the good news. You're not going to be accepted anywhere. We're not going to be part of society. Oh, we as a full... Uh, effective part of a ungodly society are we if we talk against some of the things that happen in our society we're not going to be welcomed are we that's why David Cameron is 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 pro homosexual lobby because if he was against it society would be against him he'd probably lose the election he'd certainly cause an issue wouldn't he and and so so we're not looking for praise from man. We're not looking to be elected into parliament, are we? We're looking to do what? Preach the good news, raise the dead, heal the sick, etc., etc., etc. But Christendom has taken on this military role of forcing people into agreement with them and their practices. And I say them and their practices because I don't believe that Christendom as, as a leadership or an organisation has acted within the bounds of what the fundamental tenets of our faith would decree. Mm. I think we, that's, they've stepped out of that mm -hmm. and been part of a military occupation of many lands that have enforced pagan ways upon people. Mm -hmm. Not godly ways on people, not love and honour and loving your neighbour as yourself. They've, they've decried their neighbour, they've really vilified their neighbours if they haven't done the same. As, as they've commanded. And Islam has the same theology or the same doctrine, exactly the same. Christendom in the term of Western nations and Islam in the form of Arab nations have, however, worked together, hand in glove. We don't see that, do we, very often. But they have been working hand in glove against Israel, certainly since 1948. Yes. Bachir Orr states in a book, Eurabia. Has anybody read that book, Eurabia? I recommend you read it. It's a really good book. She says this. Since the emergence of Palestinianism in the 1970s, the Arab demi-churches, that she's meaning churches that are living in Arab states under the oppression of, of uh, Muslim rule and, and are not um, are, are, are keeping quiet against Arab oppression, etc., um, I'll start again. Since the emergence of Palestinianism in the 1970s, the Arab demi churches have striven for a united front against Israel by identifying totally with the Arab Palestinian cause. And we see that today, don't we, in the, the pro Palestinian churches? They saw service to Islam as bringing together the whole Christian world in solidarity with Palestinians and promoting an anti Israel campaign in the West. That's certainly happening. Mm -hmm. with the churches mm -hmm. and we see imams coming into churches and speaking in churches we see a real alignment between the anti-Israel churches and organisations and Islam we see that real kind of uh, alignment together at Lahore in a conference in 1974 the general secretary of the conference General Hassan al Tahami, expressed his appreciation of the efforts undertaken by Christian churches all over the world to explain to the international public opinion the Arab Muslim rights to the Holy Land, particularly to Jerusalem. At this conference in uh, Lahore, this Islamic conference in 1974, th there is a recognition by the Arab nations that the church was actually promulgating the idea that the Palestinians have rights to the Holy Land and to the Holy Land sites, and partic in particular to Jerusalem and the sites in Jerusalem. 
and that and that was clearly uh, something that was promulgated by the, uh, the the World Council of Churches and other organisations. One of the points of reference of this conference, and you can get this details of this conference, was to remark on, and I'm quoting this, the constructive efforts undertaken by the Christian churches all over the world and in the Arab countries, notably Lebanon, Egypt, Jordan and Syria, to explain the Palestinian question to the international public opinion and to world religions. So basically what this conference was doing is kind of it's saying thank you to the church for actually doing the work of promoting Arab rights to the land of Israel. Uh, and it goes on to say that uh, it, th th they were grateful, the conference was grateful and solicited, their, solicited support for Abra Arab sovereignty over Jerusalem and holy places. And they said they appreciated all the work that the churches were doing. At the Fez Islamic Conference in 1980, Again, churches were praised, particularly the World Council of Churches, for actually teaching that Muslims and Islam have rights to Jerusalem and to the Holy Land. So the World Council of Churches have been praised for that. Is that working together? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Christianity and Islam working together to promote an anti-Zionist, anti-Christian, anti-biblical narrative regarding the nation of Israel and the Jews who live on the land. On the 10th of June, 1974, the European Arab Dialogue was set up. And that was a dialogue between nine European countries and Arab nations. And it began to have meetings regarding areas which they, they defined as being agriculture, industry, sciences, culture, education, technology, official cooperation and civil infrastructure and also religious rights. Um, and that EAD, that European Arab dialogue, takes place yearly between Europe and the Arab states concerning particularly the Middle East and concerning Israel. And they make decrees and make <coughs> statements regarding all those uh, individual uh, uh, specific roles such as agriculture, industry, science and all those things so that Israel is isolated from the rest of the world and particularly from the Arab nations and Europe. Are you with me up to now? Because mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you're thinking what has this got to do with me aren't you? Mm -hmm. But it's got a lot to do with you because that uh, alliance if you like between the Arab nations, the European countries and the world churches, particularly the World Council of Churches, which includes Catholic, Protestant, Charismatic, Baptists, and all these World Council of Churches, is now being uh, broken by a group called ISIS. And ISIS, I'll explain who ISIS is in a minute, but ISIS have come in and have actually said now that we want to attack and kill Christendom now. And they've they're driving a wedge between this dialogue, which is causing problems for the Arab nations and causing problems for, for the whole of the Middle East uh, situation. So that we see in the Middle East, we see that the Western world, the Western governments are supporting the overthrow of people like Gaddafi in Libya, uh, Hussein in Iraq, and allowing insurgents to come into those nations and take over those nations so that they become a fundamental Islamic state. That's what we're seeing. It, it, certainly Hussein was a really bad guy. And so was Gaddafi. Really bad guys. But they kept out the fundamental Islamic element from their nations. I'm not a politician. I don't understand the politics of the whole area, but what I do understand is that if you take away people who actually keep out fundamental elements of Islam, then what you're leaving is a vacuum for those elements to come in. And this organization, ISIS, are now moving into those areas. They're in Gaza, they're in Syria, they're in Lebanon, they're in Iraq, they're in Libya. And they, over the last few years, are filling this vacuum. Who are they? 
the, the ISIS means the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. They would prefer to call themselves the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. And the Levant includes Jordan, Israel, what they call Palestine, Lebanon, Kuwait, and it was surprise for me to see, but Cyprus. Mm -hmm. So they say they have rights for, to, for Cyprus. And other southern Turkey areas, such as Aleppo and Haiti. That is what they say as an area on which Islamic Sharia law should be pronounced, on which Islamic um, uh, governance should be uh, rule should rule those countries, and that for me was quite frightening because we we know what's happened in in Syria, we know what's happened in Lebanon, we know what's happened in in uh, Libya, Iraq, but I was surprised to see Cyprus and large areas of Turkey are being targeted by these people for uh, total control. Mm. This group in its original form was composed and supported by a variety of Sunni insurgents, because we know there are groups in Islam, and these are basically Sunnis. ISIS is known for its harsh interpretation of Islam and brutal violence, which is directed particularly against Shia Muslims and against Christians. So they target Christians, where actually Islam, prior to this group, would kind of try and control and use Christians in these areas to promote the idea that they are doing right and actually they have rights to this part of Israel and this part of Jerusalem. It has at least 4,000 fighters in its ranks who, in addition to attacks on government and military targets, have claimed responsibility for attacks that have killed thousands of uh, civilians. And this is in places like Sudan as well. Mm. ISIS has close links with Al-Qaeda. Well, they did have until recently when they came into a disagreement with Al-Qaeda because Al-Qaeda didn't agree with the ISIS principle of actually destroying Christians in the Arab lands. ISIS wanted to destroy the Christians. Al-Qaeda didn't necessarily want to do that. They wanted to use the Christians in those lands to promote their ideals. It's worth, ISIS is worth $2 billion at this very moment because people are giving to ISIS. Muslims from all over the nations are giving financial support because they see this idea of a dominion kingdom theology for Islam as being the next step on the road for Islam. Um, they've captured American weapons, they wear American uniforms because they've captured them in places like Iraq. Abu Bakar Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS, made this statement recently. He said, so take up arms and take up arms, O soldiers of the Islamic State, and fight, fight. So raise your ambitions, O soldiers of the Islamic State, for your brothers all over the world are waiting for your rescue and are anticipating your brigades. The time has come for you to free yourself from the shackles of weakness and stand in the face of tyranny against the treacherous rulers, the agents of the crusaders and the atheists and the guards of the Jews. Rush your Muslims to your state. Yes, it's your state. And they're talking about those areas, including Syria. Rush. Because Syria is not for the Syrians and Iraq is not for the Iraqis. The earth is Allah's. This is my advice to you. If you hold to it, you will conquer Rome and on the world if Allah wills. So they're saying they want to conquer. They want to rule. Yusuf al Qawadi, the most influential Sunni scholar, in, in our times today, made the prediction in 2002 that Muslims would soon rise and invade Rome itself, <coughs> the Catholic Church itself. He said this, he, meaning Mohammed, answered, the city of Herkel, meaning Constantinople, will be conquered first. Romia is the city today called Rome, the capital of Italy. The city of Herkel was conquered by the young 23-year-old Ottoman Mohammed bin Murad, known in history as Mohammed the Conqueror in 1453. The other city, Ramia, remains and we hope and believe too that it will be conquered. This means that Islam will return to Europe as a conqueror and victor 
after being expelled from it twice, once uh, from the south, from Adiseia, and the second time from the east, when it knocked several times on the doors of Athens. So that within the Muslim community and within this movement of ISIS, there is a real desire to destroy every element of Christendom and certainly every part of Israel and every Jew living on the earth. So there is a real increase in uh, potential violence throughout the world in accordance with the prophecy that Yeshua gave us in Matthew 21. Or Luke 21, sorry. So where do we stand in this? How do we stand in accordance with what's going on in our times? Because it's important. And that's why I say, I know, you know, you may look thinking, what has this got to do with us? But we have a role to play. And it's not a militant role. It's not a role in which we take up arms. It's not a role in which we speak to, in terms of hatred towards people. Whatever, whether at Christendom, or Islam. We're not here to speak in terms of hatred. I know a couple of people have suggested, is, is, is the false messiah going to come from Islam? I don't believe he is. I believe he's going to come from, as you know, he's going to come from the Jewish community. And he's going to bring together religions. I don't think that Islam is wanting in any way, shape or form to come together with any other religion. It would destroy it other religions and enforce this idea of Sharia law on the whole world and clearly the leadership of Islam, the fundamental leadership want to do that by violence, by war and we know what, we've just heard a little bit about what war says but let's have a look at what our call is because once we know what our call is, we won't be worried about the offence ahead and, and it's important for us to know for our children, isn't it? We need to teach our children how they should act. We, we want to have answers for our children because it may be them who are called to take up arms. And they want an answer. They want to know how to deal with it. They want to know how to deal with things in the spirits and the natural, don't they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the church is ready for that. I don't think the church is, is equipped or equipping people to deal with this <laughs> uprising of Islam, which is going to try and take over Europe. I don't think either the church is equipped to deal with what's happening in some parts of Christendom who are again taking up arms, ready to fight mm. if Islam is to take over. And, and, and this is exemplified in, in what I talked about with the guys, the Christians, in places like Texas and other parts of the United States. Mm. Buying arms. What's that about? So let's have a look where our role is and what Yeshua says to us about that, what God says to us about that. He says, fight the good fight. This is 1 Timothy 6.12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Our fight is a fight of faith. We have to have the faith that Yeshua is coming back. Amen. And that he's going to win the battle for us. Yes. We have to have that faith to know that if we are killed in any of these areas, if, if, if our lives are taken in any of these, say these Middle East countries, or on an aeroplane, we have to have the faith that we've got eternal life through belief and repentance. Yeah. 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 And belief in Yeshua. That, that's what we have to have. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 10.3 says, Indeed we live as human beings, but we do not wage war according to human standards. Yeah. There is no doubt Islam is waging a war against Israel and against the West by human standards. Mm -hmm. In the same way as Klaus Switch describes in his book. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt that's what they're doing. There is no doubt when Islam rises, the 1.5 billion Muslims that we have in the world, will, when it rises, the 2.5 within Christendom will have a draw based on its experience in history also to take up arms against Islam and certainly speak in terms of hatred towards Islam. But that is human standards. Yeshua will, Yeshua will come and make war, not us. We got 
preach the gospel. Revelation 19, 11, 16 says this. Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. He judges and makes war. He judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And, on, and he has a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, wearing fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with an iron rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has the name inscribed King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What a fantastic picture of the Lord coming and waging war on those who fight against God, the God who created the heaven and earth. What an amazing picture that we see there in that scripture in Revelation. We don't wage war. We don't judge. He judges. He's the only one given authority for war on the earth. He's the only one. Everything else is man's way, man's standards, man's intentions, man's oppressive view over other people in mankind. What does it say in the commandments? Love your neighbour as yourself. Preach the good news to him. Then the end will come. 1 Corinthians 15, 24, 26. Paul sums it up really well. He says, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father. And after he, says he again, has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And then he goes on to say the last enemy is death. We have a call in Christendom to stand against every lie everything which is false, everything which is untrue, and we, but we have a call to preach the truth, not to enforce the truth. We have a call to speak of the kingdom of God, not to enforce the kingdom of God on mankind. That is God's job. That is Yeshua's task. He's charged with that. Remember, he's the only one who can open the scroll. He has all power and authority to judge, to wage war. Not us. Not our children. Not their children. Not Christendom. Not Islam. No one has the authority that God has given to you. No one has that authority. <coughs> We have a call simply to preach the truth, to love one another, to walk in humility, but to walk in the truth and not to be afraid because our reward is in heaven. And whether Islam takes over the Middle East and whether they take over Europe, whether Christendom beats Islam and takes over the whole world, by a dominion theology or kingdom now view, we can guarantee one thing to the nations. And that is that the one nation that they've always tried to destroy will still be standing at the end of time. Amen. And the one that comes to wage war on them will be Yeshua, the king of those people who live in that land of Israel, the Jewish people. So let's pray. Father, I want to thank you, Father, for Father giving us peace in our nation in these times. I want to thank you that, Lord, even though I've been in war zones, Lord, I've never been part of a war on earth. I've never fought a war, and, and many in our generation haven't. 
I want to thank you for that, Lord. And I just pray that our children will not have to fight in a war. Father, I really pray for that. But Lord, you prophesied that there would be wars. Nations would rise against nations and kingdoms would rise against kingdoms. And Lord, we have to have your grace and your wisdom to understand the times we're in, that we will not be drawn into that war in the physical, but will only war in the spiritual, for the souls of men and for the governments of nations, that they would come to know you and not raise a sword in battle. So Father, would you give us that anointing? Would you give us peace? Would you take away fear? Would you give us wisdom that we would see what's happening? And Father, would you have us be envisioned to be people in your army and not man's army? And that you, Father, in these times would go before us and go before every Christian community in every nation through the world who is oppressed, either by Christendom or by Islam, particularly by Islam, and that you would protect them, Lord, whether they are Arab, Jew, believers, whatever their nationality, Father, they are your children. And Father, we pray for those Christians in Egypt, the cops in Egypt, those Christians in Bethlehem, Father, those Christians in Iraq, in Libya, Pakistan, Father, we pray for them, Lord. Father, and we ask you to keep them safe and protect them. But Lord, we ask that they would not align themselves with the powers and the enemies of Israel. But actually, Father, somehow, Father, you would help them to align themselves with you and your plans and purposes. That Israel would, Father, stand strong, be a nation, as you've called it to be a nation. And Father, that they would be prepared for your return in their hearts and their souls. Amen. Let's pray for that in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Thank you.